ELTN 132, this is week 10, lecture one, and we're going to be talking about digital pulses and waveforms. So pulses and waveforms are an important component of digital systems. Um, and, I'm, and there's a lot of different terminology, and I'll go through some of these terms as we um, kind of go through this process. So a pulse is basically a rapid change of current, which also represents a rapid change of voltage typically. And so, for example, we might have a pulse that ranges from 0 volts to 5 volts for a short period of time. This might be as short as, you know, nanoseconds, microseconds, depending on how fast the system is. Clock pulses or uh, clock generation is important um, with microcontrollers particularly. Um, every microcontroller needs some kind of high-frequency clock, typically in the megahertz. For example, the Arduino operates at 16 megahertz, a so fairly high frequency. Um, in off, often cases, the oscillator is kind of internally um, designed into the circuit, but it still needs a crystal or some other device to actually work as a precision way of developing these pulses. So this is another example where pulse waveforms are important. Digital communications is another important area where we're looking at waveforms and pulses. So for example, data transmission. If we're transmitting data from one device to another over some digital medium, usually we have a series of pulses that are used to transmit the data. TX and RX are kind of ways of abbreviation transmit and receive. Now, a simple example of this that we use probably every day, but don't even think about, is, for example, if we're looking at our keyboard, if you take a look at your keyboard in front of your computer, you'll see that there are lots and lots of buttons. And if you mapped every one of those buttons individually to an output to a computer, it'd be a huge number, right? And especially when you start looking at the shift, control, alt functions, all of that, there are lots and lots of output. So that's not a practical way to send the data. So instead what's done is we use a single line, in this case typically USB, used to be serial RS-232. So for example, if you press the letter A on your keyboard, that basically send an ASCII 65, a data packet, which are a bunch of ones and zeros. To the computer. Now the USB port makes that a little bit more complicated because there's a lot more um, uh, data control that's required to actually send USB data. But in the old days, this is literally what would happen. And so this is an important application of, of digital communication where we can transmit data from one device to another. So the next thing we're going to do is take a look at some of the different types of waveforms and um, try to do some definitions. As I mentioned, there's a lot of terminology used with this. So, um, but we're going to start with periodic waveforms. So periodic waveforms are basically repeating waveforms. Or if we take a look at a period of it, and the way that I'm defining a period is we're crossing the zero point at the same slope. So this would be the start of our point here, and here we're crossing zero at the same slope. This is not uh, the period of the waveform because we're going in the negative slope here, in a negative direction, um, if we kind of draw a little arrow there. And that section of the waveform, if you repeated it over and over, and it was exactly the same, that is referred to as a periodic waveform. Now, it doesn't mean that it's perfectly symmetrical. You could, for example, even have a digital waveform that has what may seem kind of like a random set of data. But if that same sequence repeated over and over again, it would still be considered periodic. And we're going to look at sine waves really quickly um, just to kind of talk about some of the terms. Sine waves we typically associate with AC power or audio signals. Um, but they're also used for control signals also. So let's take a look at a few of the terms and we'll be able to apply it to other types of waveforms also. So let's take a look at a single waveform here, um, an AC waveform. The amplitude is essentially, when we think of the amplitude, we think of the height of the waveform. And we're typically looking at it from a 0, 0.0 volt reference there. The frequency is dependent on the time that it takes from the starting point here to the end point, where we have one period of the waveform. So if that time, for example, is one second, the frequency is a reciprocal of that. So our period here equals one second. The frequency equals one over period. 
So we'd have one what is called a Hertz, which stands for cycle per second. So that is an example frequency. If we were at, um, if this was one millisecond instead, this is much faster signal. One over that would then change to one kilohertz, for example, 1000 cycles per second. So that's the frequency and the period. Um, the peak is typically measured from the zero point all the way to the top. Um, and if and the terms are synonymous if it's centered over zero, but it changes a little bit if there's an offset, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, if we do uh, the peak to peak value is if we're looking at the total, the highest positive value here compared to the lowest negative value. If we measured that value all the way from top to bottom, that would be the peak to peak of our waveform. And that's often abbreviated as VPP. Now, if we do something interesting, we can actually take, let's say, for example, this is an AC waveform source. It's a, a signal generator or something that's producing a sine wave or some kind of um, sinusoidal signal. If we add a battery here connected to ground, what that does is it creates what is called a DC offset. So, for example, if this is 3 volts, it would take our original sine wave and shift it up by a point that is 3 volts above the original signal level. And this is where I can kind of get into some disputes as whether this is an AC signal anymore. AC defines or AC describes a signal that is changing polarity over time. In this case, it's not really changing polarity, it's changing in magnitude, it's never going negative. But we still often call it an AC signal. Square waves are the type of waveforms that are most often used in digital systems. So for example, a square wave looks something like this. A square wave doesn't define that the pulses are symmetrical or the same width, but that it has basically a as a very fast rise time and a very fast uh, fall time in the signal sequence. Um, and s square waves can have different duty cycles. For example, we could have a short duty cycle like this, where it's only on for a small percentage of the whole period, or we could have a large duty cycle where it's on for most of the time. If you had an Arduino class before, that basically is how we can control the analog output um, as a percentage of the period. Um, triangle waves are also actually used in digital control systems, and they can be AC, where they're going negative or positive, or they can be DC, where they're completely above the zero volt point. But the terms period and frequency are the same as a sine wave, if we're looking at one period, for example, of a triangle wave. Now, what I've drawn here is kind of something of what you consider an ideal square wave. A perfect square wave would have instantaneous rise time, meaning that we can go from zero to the maximum voltage instantaneously, and it would have an immediate instantaneous fall time. And it would get up to that maximum value and stay there without any what is called overshoot or undershoot. In reality, that is rarely the case. Um, if you look carefully at data sheets or even at digital waveforms, you'll find that in reality, they do not instantly go up to a certain level but sometimes they take some time to get up to a level or, for example, to even get down to a certain level. And that is almost always due to capacitance in the circuit. Every device has um, most electronic components, digital components have a certain amount of capacitance and that slows down the rise times and fall times. Now what I've plotted here is a more realistic view of a square wave. Um, not saying that it takes a long time to get it. it might be microseconds or nanoseconds for it to get up to the level but what's important is there's some terminology that we talk about for example time rise time and that's often shown as t with a lowercase r that stands for the rise time and how that's defined is going from 10 percent of the signal to 90 percent of the signal how long it takes to get from those two points so for example if that took one nanosecond the rise time would be one nanosecond. If it took a microsecond, it'd be a microsecond. But it's not defined as the zero to maximum value. 
And there's reason for that because we can have what I'll describe shortly as overshoot, which makes that a little harder to define. Overshoot and undershoot, or what is often called ringing, is when we have a situation that the, the current transition is so fast that the actual signal kind of overshoots a little bit and typically is kind of a little bit of a sinusoidal waveform before it damps out. So that situation sometimes is tolerable. If you look at any high frequency score wave signal, you'll probably see some overshoot. But if it gets too high, it can cause problems when we're actually looking at the transitions of the waveform. So the definition that we typically use for that is the output exceeding the steady state value. The settling time essentially is if we looked at a close up of what this overshoot signal looks like. Let's see, for example, it's supposed to go from there to there. But our signal goes up and down and finally settles down. Usually we look at some kind of band from the time that that signal starts until it's within a certain bandwidth. And that may be, for example, like within 5% of the total signal level or 5% of some kind of um, defined band there. The time it takes to before you from the start of the signal until you get to that point is called the time the settling time. And that's sometimes important in control systems. Other terms that are used with waveforms are for example signal and that's a periodic waveform that sends information again typically a square wave. Modulation is the method used to generate a waveform. And so that's more often referred to with sine waves or triangle waves, but that's a way that we can actually create or generate the sound wave. Finally, noise are external electrical currents that can distort the signal. Now, pulse waveforms cannot be easily measured with a DMM, and why not? Well, if you ever try to measure voltage with a typical DMM, and you're looking at the display, you'll see that the display kind of changes every, you know, few, um, you know, maybe quarter of a second, every half second. And so if you're trying to measure some kind of waveform that's changing over time, you just get a bunch of random numbers on the screen. So the tool that we typically use for that is an oscilloscope. Um, and we can, with the oscilloscope, we can measure the amplitude, frequency, duty cycle, DC offset, all of these different characteristics. And unfortunately, we don't have access to the lab, and I can't really loan out oscilloscopes, but maybe if we get a chance next semester, you can stop in and we can uh, get a chance to use those to some extent. So we've already used, how are signal, digital signals created? We've already used the 555 timer to um, create square wave signals. And you can actually change the duty cycle and the frequency um, fairly easily with that device. But there are many other devices that are used to generate signals. Uh, function generators are the most common. So that's just a very brief kind of overview of digital signals. Um, this would usually be part of a lot larger lecture, especially if we're talking about data communication. There's a, this is just the tip of the iceberg. But I want to introduce you to some of these terms so that you're familiar with them when they come up in class or if you hear them in a class where they're talking about digital communication, for example.